Morning everyone, um, I'm here in my back garden and uh, I'm going to do another video from here. Um, not that I'm not inspired to go out into a new forest, it's more because um, I have spent some time in my garden over the Christmas period and um, I want to talk to you about what I've done here, a little bit of wildlife photography and um, what I've done to actually encourage wildlife to the garden and the setup I've got here and what lenses I'm using. So, um, first things first, don't get rid of your Christmas tree. I kept mine, <laughs> still, still on the stand as well. Um, and the reason for that is if you've got a live tree, don't just send it off to go and get shredded straight away. Um, it's quite easy to cut up and goes up quite quickly on a little burner on a fire, um, particularly the branches. They go up quite quickly on an outside fire. So, and I just cut the logs up um, and burn the sticks off on my fire indoors and on a burner outside. So yeah, first of all, keep your tree, don't get rid of it. Um, makes for a good little pop in your shoot. And you find that peanuts and things like that, seeds actually catch in some of the needles and they catch really well. I need to show you this, look at this. You can see the peanuts have, are caught in there, the pine needles there, so worth keeping. Don't get rid of your tree. So we're going to use that. And um, I'm going to talk to you about foods as well. This is uh, Derek helping me today. <laughs> um, so first things I really want to talk to you about are food. And you do need to bait your area up for a good week or two before you can actually sit down and start taking photos you need to encourage birds to keep coming to your garden you can't let your feeders run out so what i've done is i've got um white heart uh the sunflower hearts sunflower hearts i've worked out to be really good in my garden and you will need to work this out so buy small quantities of each to start with um and then find out what works and keep buying that in bulk so this is like, um, I've forgotten what this is, is it 10, 10 kilograms worth of sunflower hearts? Now I will need to change the container on this because I don't want to encourage mice in my shed. So these containers, I've got loads of these from previous ones I bought and I just keep filling them up. Um, I've got peanuts, they work, but I've also started attracting grey squirrels to the garden. So um, uh, unusual really because I'm... I'm in a town, <laughs> um, so I'm quite surprised with that, but I've got some nice big trees at the back, which is quite encouraging. Um, millworm, not something I've used a lot, but I've started just chucking out, the robin likes them. Um, and then there's the millworm suet fat. Um, blocks, which I tend to break up and just either push into the side of a tree or um, I put into the fat ball feeder and I don't tend to go for the balls I go for the the blocks you can get like 12 on Amazon a multi-pack so yeah buying bulk you'll find that in the long run it's cheaper and you don't run out and you have to buy another load so yeah these are sunflower hearts as well I transition this to this pot so this is my little food area and this is I will top up the feeders and um, yeah, you need to keep filling them up. You can't let them run out. So I'm just gonna move you off of here. Gonna walk around a bit. So what I've got, I've picked up a few little twigs and stuff and this wood was all donated to me a little while ago. And um, I've just made a stand out of it. Um, but yeah, just make something that's quite sturdy. It is worth doing. I, I don't know whether it's worth talking you through how I've come up with that. And then you can just put anything on top of it. And the reason why I'd gone for this, I picked this up in the woods. I just thought it looked interesting, but you can mount anything on top of this stand once you've made it. But you have to think of things. Um, so think about the level that I've set this up at. You don't want 
things like that in the background. Um, so you kind of want to keep your background um, clutter free, otherwise it will show up in the photos, like white spots and stuff like that. Um, and that's my hide in the corner. Um, I've just waterproofed that with some fab seal because it leaked quite a lot. Okay, bring you over to my hide. This is a two-man hide, um, but I use it as a one-man because I don't want to put a table in here with me to hold some of my stuff. What I do is I use the spare seat, and these have got cup holders as well. Um, can't remember what I paid for this, but um, I've adapted it, changed bits out on it as it's gone along because I wanted to make it more sturdy, more waterproof and stuff like that. Still not quite 100% waterproof, hence the bag. The bin liner on the base here. Um, but the seat can be a little bit damp, so I just put this down. Um, but I do have to bear in mind I can't move too much when the birds are here because they will hear, obviously, the gravel on the floor and the bin liner moving, rustling away. So I need to bear in mind when there is something present that I want to photograph, I need to keep more still and just move my arms freely, that's it. Um, so to prevent myself from getting in and out of the hide um, frequently, what I try to do is just have everything I need inside with me, whether that be gloves, hat, extra clothing, stuff like that is already in the hide with me. Um, hot drinks, all that sort of stuff is here, so I don't have to keep getting in and out. Um, I can spend up to three hours inside this hide. <laughs> Um, and I quite happily do it as well. It's, it's very peaceful um, and uh, yeah, I, I enjoy it quite a lot. So this is the next bit. What lens do I use? Well, I would recommend you use the longest lens that you have. Um, I have a um, 120 to 300 Sigma lens here. Now this is a f2.8, so it's really good in low light. I also have the 1.4 teleconverter on it. I won't have the two times, I do have it, but I won't ever use it on here because I know that the pictures become more and more soft when I start to use that. So 1.4 is my limit. Um, and that gives me a little bit more um, reach, if you like, to get those birds. Now, I have recently got, and you would have seen it in my last video, the uh, 200 to 500 mil Nikon lens. Um, and I do, I have been using that one a little bit as well. In fact, I was so excited that if you, if you do get a new lens, use it in your back garden first so you can get used to it, understand um, where it's sharp, where it's um, out of focus, how many f-stops you need to use before it's pin sharp. Get an understanding of that lens, stand in the same place, take photos of objects in front of you, just get an understanding of it. Also this type of photography is good for trying out a new lens as well because you're not far from home and you can keep going in and out um, checking your pictures, stuff like that. That's the lenses. And now, I'm going to talk to you about tripods. Now, I've got a few tripods. I'm lucky enough to have this one, which has been battered by the sea. Um, this is a slick tripod, a Pro 700DX, really old, really old. The foam feels like it's cracking and gone a bit weird. Uh, it has been left out in the rain once, but it's still working absolutely perfect. Um, I do have to put oil on it and brush the thread on the top um, because that goes a bit rusty. And obviously I don't want to damage the ones on my um, collar or my lenses. So this is something you need to make a decision about. Lenses that are um, 
extended zooms up to 500 mil, 600 mil are heavy. Do you want to be sat there holding it? Because sometimes you do have to hold the lens for quite a period of time when you know something's landed near where you want it to be before it lands on your pop area you might be holding that lens for extended periods of time now it can ache unless you obviously figure out a way to hold that lens tripods are great they're good for that you're already aimed at where you want to be you just need to move your hands up take the shot um, and you've got very restricted movement up, down, left, right in the same spot. Um, now I find that quite restricted, especially when a bird is suddenly off right to the left hand side of the hide window and you want to turn the whole camera that way. Some of the lens might be sticking out the end of the hide. So what I try to do, if I'm holding it by hand, it's a lot easier for me to go and aim it and take the shot. So bear that in mind, I feel like you've got more freedom with your, your arms to point wherever you want, but you'll be holding that lens for extended lengths of time to get shots. Um, and yeah, you'll be building your muscles up in your arms. <laughs> um, so I try not to use a tripod. I do sometimes, um, but most of the time I'm freehanding. I have um, uh, vibration reduction on air you might have image stabilization or optical stabilization if you're on sigma um, but yeah that can save the day a little bit um, so that's the lenses zoom lenses must have zoom lenses if you want to get that reach I think 300 mil is probably your minimum that you want for this type of photography um, and you probably will be cropping those images as well. But if you've got birds in flight because you're zoomed out a little bit, um, then those shots might be even better to crop because you've got it. Whereas if I'd zoomed in at 500 mil and tried to get a bird in flight, I might have got it just leaving the frame rather than in the frame. Um, and that can be quite annoying as well. When you see an image where the head is pinned sharp but the rest of the bird is out of the shot, it's quite annoying that it, that one slipped away. So maybe with um, 300 mil, you will get a more panned out shot and get more in the frame uh, if they're in flight. We find with um, uh, goldfinches, they tend to fight on the feeder if there's not many pegs on there and you can get them in flight and they look great when they're in flight because you've got the yellow feathers on their wings um, and to get them blurry and their heads pin sharp amazing pictures on sunny days where the sun is on the foreground but the background is in the shade so that's the most interesting shot for anyone really you want the bird in the light the background in the dark because that's quite good framing when it's the other way around, it doesn't always work very well. You'll find your background will be overexposed just so that you can get the detail of the bird in the foreground, which is in the dark. Um, that way it doesn't really work very well. So you need to think about either changing your angle there or waiting for the light to change. Flat days are good. Um, if you've got an overcast day, they're all right so long as it's light enough to shoot where you are if you're surrounded by shaded areas um, from trees and stuff like that then you're going to be even in you're going to be even more in lower light and um, so your iso is going to creep right up so you need to bear that in mind so good light overcast days are okay but make sure you've still got some good light there um, but you're going to expect a little bit more noise in your photos because your ISO is going to be creeping up into the, um, I don't know, 6400 area. Um, but yeah, so if you want to get the shot, it's better to have it sharp and get the shot than to have it blurry and not get the shot. So introduce ISO. There's software out there. Even Lightroom can fix that later on reduce some of that noise for you. Um, you don't want to underexpose and then make it lighter to expose it in Lightroom either because that will 
um, introduce more grain to it. So try and get your exposure right while you're out. You want the histogram all up to the left hand side, or oh no, so the right hand side of the shot. Um, but don't blow out the white areas on it. Blue, blue tits are quite hard because they've got white areas around their, their heads. So those are the bits that you need to make sure are not flashing at you on the back of the camera when you look at the highlights. Um, yeah, so next bit, let's, set, let's just do a typical setup and um, I'll talk you through my settings and how I've gone about doing that. Let's move on. So before I go on any further, I just want to point out that you can actually use a chair, hide behind a bush or something like that in your garden and just poke the lens through. Um, I've done this before, um, but what I found is the hide offers me protection from the elements and um, at this time of year it's cold and you get a bit of a cold breeze and this just keeps the cold breeze off of me. Sometimes I put a mat down inside the hide just to raise my feet off the floor because if it's frosty and cold that cold comes through and you get cold feet and that's not a nice feeling either. Now you're about to sit down, you're about to, you've got your camera ready and you're about to take your shots. Um, now think about how long you're going to be sat there for and whether you want food, drink, things like that. Even entertainment because you could be sat there for half an hour before the birds turn up because they need to, they, they might see you getting into your hide and they might be a little bit reluctant to come close because they know you're there. Um, I tend to go near the hide when there's less birds around um, so they don't see you go in. If you're on a chair and you're just sat there you might want to get a table about the same height so you're not moving so much. You haven't got to reach down, bend down, pick up your drink or something like that. You need it near you so you're literally sat there. Your, your torso doesn't move. It's more your hands that are doing all the movement. And that's the next thing, gloves. You need to get yourself a good pair of gloves. Um, don't have to be camouflaged, just has to blend in. Um, I've got a robin in on the feeder right now. Doesn't seem bothered about me at all, just sat here talking. I'm literally five meters away from it. I've got a blue tit as well now coming back. Let's go through the camera settings now and um, I'll get comfy in the hive. Cool. So, once the hide's all set up, I try not to touch the sides after this. I've got windows on the sides and obviously this big zip in the front. I can zip that up and use the Velcro area with a camouflage net. But I find this is okay in the garden, this works. Um, and I've had uh, woodpeckers on the tree in front of me, which is about five meters in front of me. And don't seem too bothered that they see my head. Um, I think it's a human figure that they see and they tend to not come near you. Um, I've actually got birds around me now. <laughs> um, I might use a tripod because I'm going to get some video here as well. Um, but generally I, I like to handhold when I'm taking the photos here because it gives me a, a larger window to move and I can sit back a bit. Whereas the tripod is fixed a little bit more further forwards and the lens might stick out. It doesn't work as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to now sit here with my 100 to 500. Now, I've set up parameters in here for the ISO. You can do that too on your camera. If you look online, um, type in something like wildlife um, setup for your brand of camera. I guarantee someone's already done it. And you're just setting up your maximum ISO that your camera will allow. Um, and I'm doing this fully in manual, but the ISO is automatic. So I set my uh, f-stop to 5.6 and I might move it up to 7.1. That's my limit there that I'm using. 
and I'm also um, shutter I try to fix that around a thousand I don't come lower than that because that's when things start to get a bit blurry um, and I just stay in that ballpark bigger and let the RSO fix itself with the automatic RSO now on a sunny day um, you might be able to get more shutter because if you watch the RSO in your shots when you preview them on the back the RSO might come down a lot more and give you a bit more play to get more shutter in there so you can freeze the bird wings in, in flight yeah now it's just a case of patience um, we're going to sit here and wait for something to happen and take a few shots Right, um, I think that's it for now. Uh, I've had quite a good day. Hopefully you would have seen the uh, gold crest which went through the Christmas tree, which was uh, quite nice. I've got waves of everything coming in at once and then it just all disappeared for a little while. So you need to find something to do in between. The other thing I'll, I should have pointed out back at the start is there's a tree at the back of the garden which I call a, a safe zone, an exit zone for the birds. Um, you don't want to sit between that and where you're feeding and where you're photographing. So you kind of want to give them a good escape route if they panic. Um, if you sit in the way of it, then they probably won't visit. Um, you could alternatively sit to one side of that escape tree and you should be able to get your shots of birds on the little twigs and branches on there, but I, I think that's a bit messy. Le let them have that. Um, that's their escape route. I'm not gonna block it or get in the way of that. Um, so yeah, hopefully you've seen some really good footage of the squirrels visiting as well, and even the um, great spotted woodpecker. Yeah, that's it for now. Um, if you haven't already, give me a like and subscribe. Hit the bell up in the corner if you wanna be notified when my next video is coming out and uh, until then until next time bye for now <laughs>